Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Joining me in center ring today is a Pittsburgher. Now, I'm from Pittsburgh. I may have mentioned that, but I always love talking to other Pittsburghers, and I constantly go back like I am going back for Christmas this year. And I find it so coincidental that I ran into L. Barr. Welcome, L. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here today. Oh, this is going to be so exciting for people. So L. is a family law attorney. She's also judicial education coordinator at Our Family Wizard, which is a communication device for people who don't have the best communication, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So L's background is in these areas. She's been a court-appointed attorney for abused and neglected minors, and that was in New Jersey, I believe, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, She's also been a guardian ad litem and a minor's counsel, and these are pretty heavy positions when there are litigated cases and children need to be represented. Correct, Al? Yes. Very heavy, very challenging. So in your 18 years of doing this level of work, and because this is a podcast devoted to amicable divorces, please start educating us and talking to us about how to take the hardest cases and move them forward in the best way possible. That's a great place to start. And the most difficult, challenging cases are when parents will not do the three C's of co-parenting. They refuse to communicate, they won't compromise, and they will not cooperate. Children, they just want to love each parent without feeling guilty about it. They want to feel supported. They want their parents to encourage them to share their feelings, whether positive or negative. Children, they want to be heard. They want a voice. So we, the family law community, all of us, we need to make sure that our parents are keeping the children out of the arguments, that they are not a part of the conflict, that we are never using the children as messengers, And especially when you're fighting, you don't want to fight in front of your children. So that would be my very first tip tip of advice on this podcast to all of our listeners. Let's keep it behind closed doors. Let's use our, uh, what we were taught from a very, very young age. If you have nothing nice to say, don't say it at all. I think I need to review that lesson as well. For me. (laughs) Okay. I love what you said. I like the three C's. As a matter of fact, I follow up with a blog every time I um, air a podcast episode and I'm going to put the three C's in the blog. I love this. I want to say it again. Communicate, compromise, coordinate. Now, because it sounds easy, but it's not, how can parents get help to adhere to these three points? There are a lot of resources available for parents. One is Our Family Wizard, and I happen to be the education coordinator for Our Family Wizard. It is the co-parenting communication app. It provides parents with tools so that they can... I love your dog. That's okay. Dogs are part of the, of our life. There are tools on the platform so parents, they can communicate securely. They can communicate with a tone meter that assists them so that if there are emotionally charged words or there is an inappropriate tone that may come across in the message, they're alerted. Don't send this message. It might be humiliating. It might be upsetting. It might come across as aggressive. There are other tools that allow the parents to streamline communication as well and to schedule parenting time, to schedule events. There's a calendar where they could put on birthdays, holidays, 
They can share important information about the family and they can manage expenses. That's one thing when there's high conflict or parents just can't seem to get on the same page to co-parent. This is a tool and a platform that really, really assists families. And I have seen firsthand, I see every single day how it benefits the children and the entire family. Do the parents kind of calm down, Al, with this piece of, can I appropriately call it artificial intelligence? Because if it's saying you sound aggressive, you're humiliating. (laughs) I mean, that's artificial intelligence, isn't it? It is. And our family wizard worked with a company. They came up with algorithms in order to create this tone meter tool. And we see that it really, really helps reduce. And in some situations, in some cases, eliminates the aggressive tone, the humiliating tone and the conflict that comes as a result of that. God, this is so fascinating. I mean, in 10 years of doing what I do, mediation and you know, uh, legal document preparation, I've never literally seen except one time a client brought in with her cell phone because it's on the cell phone, right? So she brought in her cell phone. She said, here, this is, this is what it looks like. But she wasn't typing out a message that may have been um, addressed by our family wizard, OFW, the acronym OFW. And so that in and of itself that tone meter, I guess whether it's overt or covert, can really start working with us, the user, softly to kind of get in the groove of speaking differently? Correct. It helps you reframe the way you communicate. It helps you. And I listened to one of your podcasts on Biff and It's very similar. It helps parents to be brief, informative, factual, and friendly. It helps them to be kind, to co-parent, to streamline, to focus on what's important. And once you do that and you get the conflict out of the way, yes, there's still going to be pain. There's still going to be frustration, but it allows parents to focus on what's important, to put their children first, to prioritize the needs of their children. That is, you know, that's the phrase, the best interest of the child, focus on the needs of the children. Of course, that's the right thing to do. And I can't remember exactly how you phrased it a few minutes ago, but you were talking about what children want. And with all of these videos, and there's many of them out there of children, you know, talking about their experiences going through the divorce, because the divorce happens to them as well. It's not their divorce. It's the parent's divorce but it's part of their life. And the one overriding concept that came out of every one of these videos that I saw was this. Your children may be concerned about having to live in a different house, if they're going to forget things, if they're going back and forth to two parents' homes. Will they change schools? Will they still have their friends? You know, these are all things that are part of children's lives. And of course, they're going to be concerned about it. But the bottom line seemed to come out in every one of these videos with kids, and that is, as long as our parents got along, we could accept anything. Now, isn't that a wonderful idea to start from as parents? It is. And that's where parents need to take a step back, a step outside and look in, have self-awareness, understand the needs of their children and what their children want. The biggest fears and concerns that I see when I go out as a GAL, as a guardian ad litem, and I'm doing my investigative work, I'm meeting with the child so that I can report back to the court as to the child's wishes, position, and wants in addition to what I believe is in that child's best interest, the number one question posed to me by children are, the question is, what is going to happen to my family? It's that unknown. Where am I going to live? Where's daddy going to live? What's going to happen to my family? Uh, What's going to happen to my siblings? Are we going to all go to daddy's on the same night? Are we going to split up? What we need to do and what parents need to do is assure that their children know what the plan is. And I say this all the time, but parents need to join forces 
And in order to co-parent, they need to create a narrative together and they need to decide what they're going to tell their children, what their children are going to know and what they're not going to know and make sure that the children come first in that narrative. What does that look like? The children come first. Can you give an example maybe? Yes. So parents, what they need, they get so caught up in the conflict. They get so caught up in, well, we have this orthodontic bill or we have um, these appointments that need to be taken care of and the scheduling and the timing. They need to put all that aside and they need to focus on the child's needs and, you know, put their pain aside as well and focus on the child's pain. Do we need, you know, therapeutic services for the children? We need to get that on the calendar first to start before any conversation about, you know, the $500 bill about the palate expander. So prioritizing the children, you know, yeah. He needs I'm sorry, to that was funny to me. That was laughing. Really funny. It's true though. Like there's so much arguing about, you know, a $500 bill for this or a $750 bill for this. What about you know, the therapy appointment that still hasn't been scheduled or the behavioralist or the appointment with the teacher to talk about implementing the IEP recommendations for the child. A lot of these things end up being overlooked because the parents are so caught up in their own conflict. So, I mean, it's so easy for us to understand what has to happen to make things better. But when people are in fight or flight, when people are so consumed with the fear, the anger, the hurt, they're still on their emotional roller coaster. Um, It has been said that divorce is mostly emotional and very little legal. And if you don't go through the emotion first, your legal is going to expand beyond belief and it doesn't really have to. So, What do you think about this idea? If parents are in the middle of legal discussions and they're so highly emotional, can they just say, can we stop for a minute? Can we take a couple weeks off? Can we take our breath? What can parents do for their own self-care so that they can come back to the legal process and make the best decisions possible, and come back to the communication with the other co-parent so that they can make rational decisions and hopefully enjoy being co-parents. What can we say to them? I think that's a great idea. I think parents sometimes need a timeout more than the kids. It's funny because all the time you hear this quote, criminal court is where bad people are on their best, Right. And yes. in family court, good people are on their worst. The worst. You're so right. Yeah. And that's what we see. That's what I see day to day in my hearings. You see the absolute worst. And it's because of the high emotion and the conflict. And it's two things that parents care about most, their children and money. So I think taking that break, giving themselves a timeout is something that's really, really important. If they're so caught up in the emotion, I think our attorneys maybe sometimes need to tell parents, you know what? Let's take a breather. Let's take a timeout. I know I served as a mediator um, when I first started off my career, and I know you do a lot of mediation. So oftentimes when I could tell that things were getting heated, I would say, you know what, guys? Let's just do a caucus. Let's just break out. I'm not sure if that's your practice. Yes, and I would love absolutely to hear what- it is. It is. Caucus okay. meaning separate them, get them out of the same room, individual rooms. The mediator goes back and forth. Yep, exactly. So I saw that that was a way to reduce the tension in the room. It got people to just go take a break, get a glass of water, rethink what's going on, refocus and then come back to the table. And I think it's a really important practice. If we're in court and we see that our clients just, they cannot control themselves, ask the judge for a continuance. Stand up and say, Your Honor, at this time, I'm respectfully requesting a continuance. The judge may or may not ask why. 
If the judge, you know, has a heavy docket, the judge may say, okay, counsel, come up with a new date. We'll come back in 30 days. And you know what? In those 30 days, you may see that the parents are getting along better. They're negotiating. They're settling some of those issues. Maybe they're using a platform like Our Family Wizard, and now they can finally communicate with each other without being aggressive or without humiliating each other. And oftentimes, we need to sometimes do that for our clients and do that for these families. Yeah, I, I really think um, that taking the time out is so helpful. Because sometimes you can just get involved in an argument and you lose sight of the what you want is the end result. You can even forget why you're even in the argument. And it's so easy to do because this is one of the biggest things that happens to us in our lives is divorce. My heart goes out to everybody who has children. It's hard enough when there aren't children. And now, and now you have to deal with your own self and your own change in circumstances when you're going, to, going from married to single. But you have this ongoing obligation of taking care of the children. My heart goes out to every parent. I'm amazed at every parent who gets through this. So, yes, whatever we can do to help. Um, Elle, you, when we first talked and met, you asked me to watch a video of a woman named Dr. Harris, right? And Dr. Harris was talking about this concept uh, by the acronym ACES, A-C-E-S. And it really goes to the heart of maybe why parents are drama filled as they're going through divorce and trying to deal with children because there is this historical evolution of trauma and pain in our lives. Would you please explain what this ACEs is and how this knowing about this can be helpful to people um, that may have difficult co-parenting relationships? Sure. ACEs is an acronym. It stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And the video that you referenced, it is a TED Talk by Dr. Nadine Harris-Burke. And in that TED Talk, I strongly recommend if you're going through a divorce or you are separated or you are divorced, pull that up, watch it. It'll inform you and educate you on how childhood trauma impacts and leads to negative health outcomes in adulthood. And I will just explain a little bit more about ACEs to your listeners because it's important for everybody to know about ACEs, not just individuals going through a separation and divorce, but physicians, teachers, uh, anybody who interacts with a child or any children needs to know about adverse childhood experiences. So back in the late 90s, Kaiser and the CDC conducted a research study. And what they did was they pulled 17,000 individuals to participate in this study. And they compared these individuals' adverse childhood experiences. So the adverse childhood experiences can be divided into three broad categories. There is abuse, neglect, in household household changes. So under abuse, we have physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Under neglect, there is physical neglect and emotional neglect. Under household challenges, there's several different types of household challenges children can face. There's mental illness of a parent, there's substance abuse by a parent, exposure to domestic violence, incarceration of a parent, and last but not least, the divorce or separation of a parent. Now, all of these different um, categories under ACEs are considered adverse experiences a child could have. Now, I'll go back to the study. What happened during the study was these 17,000 adults, well, 17,000 plus adults, were asked to complete a survey. Now on the survey, they checked off each adverse childhood experience that they were exposed to. 
So for each experience, for each type of trauma, they got a point. And at the end of the study, the participants got a final score. So what the study did was they correlated those final scores with health outcomes of the adults. Now, the findings are alarming. But again, like I said, when I first started describing what ACEs, what it means, what the study was, we all need to be aware of this. They found out that there is a direct connection between early adversity and negative health outcomes later in life. So the higher the participants' ACEs score was when they completed that survey, the greater the chance of a poor health outcome in adulthood, meaning heart disease, diabetes, obesity, mental illness, and even death. Now, we know from additional research research that adverse childhood experiences, it actually creates toxic stress and trauma on children. And this trauma, it impacts brain development. And because of that, it could lead to compromised immune system, hormonal changes, and all these other negative health outcomes. I read um, recently that the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, he opined that the single greatest unaddressed health concern facing our nation is ACEs, is adverse childhood experiences. So, you know, that really fits with this other concept that therapists talk about, Al. I don't know if you're aware of it, but I I have a lot of therapist colleagues because of mediation. Um, You know, we kind of work hand in hand sometimes. And there's this thing called the genome family tree. Have you ever heard of this? I've not. No, tell me about it. Okay, so this is interesting because honestly, it, it fits part and parcel with ACEs. This is great. And this is what, now that you have given this information on ACEs, and I totally get where you're coming from and, 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 and the, um, the impact. So the genome family tree, um, there, some therapists who use it will say to their clients when they come in, uh, divorcing clients, and, and they want counseling to get through the divorce. Uh, one one person will just talk about all this adverse behavior the other spouse has. And the therapist, and I started doing this too, just as one question. It's all I had to do, one question. And that is, do you know anything about how your spouse grew up? Do you know anything about their relationship to their parents? Do you know anything about the, their parents' relationship to each other? You know, were there any drugs? Or there, was there a lot of turnover in work, making an unstable household? Were parents at home? Uh, was it a close and loving relationship? Just asking that one question makes the light bulb go on in the person, the spouse who's talking, and all of a sudden they can see a connection between how their spouse grew up and how their spouse is behaving now. Because even though we think, oh, we're never going to be like our parents. I'm never going to do that. (laughs) Oh, are you kidding? Never, ever. And then all of a sudden, oh, shoot. That's exactly what my parents did because we have this muscle memory. Right. They're learned behaviors. Yeah. And we can't get away from them unless we're aware of them. Correct. Yeah. So where does this study go? Now, I listened to the TED Talk, you know, because I wanted to be prepared for this discussion with you. And because I was interested, it's, it's in my, my business. So I listened to, and she was brilliant. Dr. Harris was brilliant. I think she was on Oprah too. There was an Oprah interview as one of the samples for this discussion. But then I started thinking, okay, this knowledge is great, but how can this knowledge be implemented and used to, to mitigate, to stop, to prevent? Or, or, or can we? What do you think? Absolutely. And just being here today with you, thank you for this opportunity to educate your listeners on adverse childhood experiences. That's the first step. The first step is 
prevention and education, letting the public know, bringing awareness to our communities, and first and foremost with the parents who are going through a separation or a divorce, to let them know your actions, what you say, what you do during your divorce is going to directly impact your children. I strongly and firmly believe that pediatricians, they should be screening for ACEs at every single well visit. They, in addition, you know, when you go in and you've got your baby, they're talking to you about, you know, how many bottles did your baby take, you know, on this day, on that day? They're asking you, oh, are your outlets covered? They're going over all this different information about caring for your child and ensuring that your child is safe and healthy. Well, guess what? They should also be looking to see has your child been exposed to any of these adverse experiences? I think we can mitigate damage that has already been done if we really understand it and we identify it. So we screen it, we identify it, and then we can treat and support the children who've gone through these experiences. And how? The same way we support children who are struggling in school. We have them assessed. They meet with a specialist. They meet with a team. If they need an IEP, an IEP is drafted up. Or if they're a little one and they need early intervention, early intervention services are provided. So the same way that we help with physical development and academic development is the same way we need to address adverse childhood experiences. We need to get the children in therapy and with the right supports to address the issues. I think that's a great idea. I, I, I really love what you just said because awareness is the first step. If you're not aware, I mean, you know that if something's going on in the house, you don't like it. You know, if you're the observer and you're not part of that behavior, you know you don't like it. Um, but I, I, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think maybe a lot of times parents just simply focus on the yelling. Uh, if there's yelling, okay, this isn't going to be good. But there's so many other behaviors other than yelling that can start influencing kids in a negative way, things that you, that you already listed. And so I really do get that if in the pediatrician's office um, they asked those additional questions, just like the genome tree, when you say, hey, so do you know anything about how your spouse grew up? All of a sudden, the light goes on. They start evaluating and solving their own issues and understanding and becoming more empathetic. And okay, so you can't blame your spouse, but you do have to do something about it. I think this is great, Al, that if the pediatrician started asking these questions, then the light bulbs could start going on and within the community of parents, um, they can start working individually. Absolutely. And hopefully that would lead to reduced conflict if they have some more self-awareness and they think, oh gosh, my child's got, you know, two check marks on their ACEs screening. This is not good. You know, we need to be concerned. So it helps the parent refocus and think, you know what? we're separated right now, we're going through a divorce, we need to make sure we're allies and that this is going to be amicable. Okay. Now I'm going to go to another type of family law case that I know you've worked in. And even if you don't remember what you told me about it when we talked last week, I have my notes written down because you were completely brilliant when you said this. See, we don't remember our own brilliance sometimes. So I, I have to remind people of how smart they are every now and then. And you said something so cool. So I had brought up to you, and I'm bringing up to the audience, um, paternity cases, cases where there are children and the parents are not married. Sometimes they're the hardest cases of all. And I think for a variety of reasons, either it was unintended to get pregnant and there were no plans to get married. So, oh shoot, now this locks us into a relationship. But I asked you why paternity cases were so hard. And I can give you the answer right now that you can springboard off of. Do you remember what you said? <sighs> Probably something about trust and communication. What did I say? You're, Remind okay, me. you're half perfect. You said there's no foundation of trust and it's highly emotional. 
the situation. And can you talk about there's no foundation of trust? It may seem obvious, but I think it bears an explanation. Sure. When there is a case where paternity is disputed, there clearly is no foundation of trust. This means mom does not know who the father is for sure. And paternity testing is ordered. The named father goes in for genetic testing. It comes back to the court. It comes back sealed and closed. The attorneys don't even know. We're always like, we're sitting there sometimes like, oh my God, it's like Jerry Springer. Like, <laughs> who's the dad? Is this one the dad? Um, and when you're the GA, I mean, we can't say that, but you know, that's what's going on in our heads. And again, this is non-dissolution. They're not dissolving their marriage. They were never married. We don't know if this was, you know, a one night stand. We don't know what happened um, oftentimes, but we do know that mom's not a hundred percent certain who the father is. So clearly there was no foundation of trust with this relationship. And with no trust, where do you build? Where do you go when there's no roots. People always do the analogy about being a tree and having roots and growing and becoming strong and then branching off. There's nothing there. They, they, they start, they, they don't have those roots. They don't have trust. And then with the emotion and the conflict, and then the two most important things that we started this conversation off about money and children, where, where do we go from there? So these cases are very challenging and extremely emotional. Something else that I noticed, and I know I'm bringing this up for the first time with you, but um, one of the other things I noticed is when people are together a while, unmarried, they seem to be doing fine. And then they get married, it doesn't work out. And they have children along the way. It doesn't seem to work out. It seems to me that there are some people that work best without the legal confines of marriage. They just need that free and open space. And when they get married, and I asked a therapist friend of mine about this, and and the answer was, because when we get married, we have preconceived notions of our roles, of our spouse's roles, and if they don't fit in those roles, then things go south, yet they were fine with each other before the marriage. Do you have any comment on that? I agree. And I think people set themselves up for failure because of their expectations. There's the quote from William Shakespeare, expectation is the root of all heartbreak. I mean, we hear that over and over. Oh my gosh, I have never heard that. And I love that. I'm glad I could Expectation share is the root of all heartbreak. Expectation is the root of all heartbreak. And then going off of that, nothing hurts more than being disappointed by the single person that you thought would never hurt you. Nothing. Yes. Nothing is more painful than that. That makes perfect sense. That really does. So we've got these two different examples of you have been together for a while, and as soon as you get married, things don't work out. But then we have the other example of there's just more cases like the one we talked about first, and that is unmarried, perhaps never expected to have the child, and oh gosh, here we are. Don't believe in abortion, so we're going to have the child. Let's see if we can make it work. But your point is so well taken. Without that foundation of trust, you have nowhere to go. And so what do we do? How can we help people in that situation that want to have the child, want to see what they can do about co-parenting? And it's extremely difficult. What kinds, what can we give them as maybe some tools or avenues of help? The same as in a dissolution matter where parents are going through divorce, it's the same, those three C's. I always go back to that compromise, communicate, cooperate. And our experiences, they define us. That's who we become, have experiences together. 
you know, create that foundation of trust. Even if you're not going to end up getting married, you have a child together. You need to co-parent. So you need to figure out how to do those three C's. Most importantly, communicate and make sure that you prioritize this child. If you are going to bring a child into this world, you need to make sure that that child comes first. Yes. And then there's therapy. I just thought about this. So there's, there's, you can go to a therapist because I had a couple this year come in the office, young child, I think she was two. And they asked me for a referral for a therapist who could help them communicate the best way possible so they could co-parent their child. Okay. This, these are evolved thinkers. I have never had anybody ask me that question. But to share with the audience, a therapist can really be helpful to both of you to show you how to communicate. There are no expectations that you're going to be together. But to be able to be proud of yourself as a co-parent, to know you're doing the best you can possibly do, And then I think I would add one other little thing, and that is it takes two people to argue. It takes one person to simply be an asshole, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So for those, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yes. Right. And I agree with you. And I would just echo that, yeah, get the services that you need. If you think co-parenting counseling is what you need, then there are places available. I I mean, I know I've been in touch with several different forensic custody evaluators who are now doing co-parenting communication therapy and reunification therapy. So it's been around, it's going on, and that is definitely a great resource. And like I said, our behaviors, sometimes they could be learned behaviors, but also our skills and especially our communication skills they can also be learned and you could go and get help and you could use platforms also similar to Our Family Wizard that will help you and enable you to communicate effectively and respectfully with your co-parent. Say again what you just said a minute ago about there are, there are attorneys who, and you named two things. What did you there, just say? I now know of um, a few, they're forensic custody evaluators So they do the evaluations for the court and they provide reports and recommendations with respect to custody and visitation. The parents go, they sit for their psychs, the evaluators see the interactions between the parents and the children. A lot of those evaluators and those psychologists, they're now doing what you just um, had mentioned, the co-parenting communication therapy. And they're also doing, if there's Um, In alienation case, they're doing reunification therapy. Ah, okay. That was it. Reunification therapy. Got it. Elle, could you explain what parental alienation is? the, The term is thrown around a lot, so just to define it. I may not be the best person to give a definition, and um, I generally try to avoid. getting involved in parental alienation disputes or issues. I focus on best interests of the child. How do we protect this child? How do we make sure that they're prioritized? And how do we make sure that this child is in the best place that they could possibly be? So when those allegations arise, that usually comes from counsel for the parent and then it other counsel, you know, for the other parent will respond to that. I, I, tend to not get involved in those types of things. Right. But what it looks like is one parent is frozen out of the relationship with the children. Is that kind of simply said? That's the allegation. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now, I just wanted to know what it looks like because people talk about it and um, it's, it's nice for people to know exactly what it is so that if it's happening, they, they understand. Um. Would you like to, as we kind of wind down this discussion, is there anything I haven't asked? Is there anything that you would like to communicate that you think is important, but we haven't done it yet? That's a good question. Um, One thing that I think is really important for your listeners to think about is 
the ages of their children because every age is impacted by divorce, but in different ways. So what may work for a teenager is not necessarily going to work for a three-year-old. So I want the family law community and to your parents who are listening, to attorneys who are listening, remember, if we have babies and toddlers, that's one group, and we have preschoolers and school-age children, that's another group, and we have teenagers, that's a third group. That's how I try to break down the children. You know, think about that age. Think about what they're going through. If we've got a toddler, most likely this is a stage where, you know, they're very attached to the primary caregiver. And when we're talking about parenting schedules and we are discussing overnights and moving this toddler from house to house, really put that toddler first. Think, you know, if I was that two and a half or three year old, what would I want? If my parents were separating and divorce, getting divorced, where would I want to be? I, you know, I'm used to, you know, this parent always putting me to bed and reading me the story in my bed here. We see a lot of children in this age group really, really struggling with, you know, outbursts, behaviors. They don't know how to communicate yet. There's a lot, a lot of problems with sleep schedules. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these age groups and how to best plan your parenting schedules. Because we have a lot of parents saying, well, I want 50-50. I want the two, two, three. So if you got a three-year-old and three-year-old's going, you know, two days with mom, two days with dad, three days with mom, three days with... That is a lot for a little one. Um, and then with the pre... Not just... Um, little ones, but when they get into preschool and they're school age, and you mentioned this at the beginning with, you know, where's my backpack? Where are my things? Whose house am I sleeping at? In this age, it's very egocentric. It's me, 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 me. And these kids, they're internalizing everything. Keep that in mind for this age group and think about how your divorce, how they could take that and that that internalization can create so much stress. And that goes back to the ACEs that we were talking about earlier. You know, support your kids at this age group. They really, really need to know that you're there for them, that you're a team, that you're going to do those three C's. And that, you know, if they are acting out, you know, take a step back and think, okay, why is my child acting out right now? And think about that age. And then for teenagers, you know, they're very, very concerned about their appearances and their peer groups and fitting in. Um, they're able to think more critically than the me, 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 me school age kids. And then the little ones who are just having their cognitive abilities developing that toddler baby age. Teenagers are very, very different. And you know what? They be very well may be accepting of the divorce and they may be understanding because they may be relieved that the yelling and the screaming and the conflict is finally coming to an end. Talk to them. Always talk to your kids, no matter what the age, but take their age into consideration and always support your children and be there for them and prioritize them and put them first. So if you're going to put your children first and you're hurting, you really have to take care of yourself as well. You do, but who's going to take care of those kids? Who's going to make sure? No, no, no. I mean, you have to do self-care for yourself while you're caring for the children. You have to address where you're at emotionally as the parent. Right, right. You need to get all the help that you need as well. It's an extremely challenging emotional time. And there's a lot on everyone's plate when there's a separation and divorce. Mm Mm-hmm. It is, like you said at the beginning, probably the most difficult time of anybody's life. And especially now during the holidays, you know, we need to be kind to each other. We need to share the love, support each other and be there. You know, if I may just do a quick follow up on the um, co-parenting schedules, there's no one formula that's right for everybody. And maybe, Al, tell me what you think. Um, you have to have more than one parenting plan. If you have three children and they're at different ages, like you just mentioned, different categories, and they need different things, possibly you could have one schedule for the youngest and another schedule for the oldest. I know that, well, I see that parents would like to keep all three children together when they're moving between homes, but 
maybe that's not the best for your family. What do you think? I agree. Every family is different. Every situation is different. I've never had a case that is exactly the same. And sometimes two or three different parenting schedules may be best for this family. And that's another thing that I see on the Our Family Wizard platform. We have a calendar feature where parents can do that, where they can create two or three different parenting schedules and base it based on that child. So let's say the parents have a baby. They have an eight-month-old. They've got a five-year-old. And let's say they also have a teenager. And they need to figure out what they're going to do with the three kids and how. And it becomes very complicated. And if you want to stay organized, use this type of platform. So you can create those three different calendars and you can keep your family in sync and you can help your family thrive during this very, very challenging time. So I think the bottom line on all of this is you have a lot more control and influence than you think, not only over yourself, but over the situation at large. And knowing how damaging adverse behavior child. is, yeah, adverse child trauma is, um, just maybe could even help you in the moment, you know, when you're struggling to respond to something, just, okay, hold on a minute. Let me wait a second. Let me choose what I want to do. You know, Slowing down, just slowing down and breathing is so important. And I don't know that divorcing parents give themselves this time um, or think that they can. I think they feel that they are um, swept up in the system, in the process. And we'll go back to what we said earlier, and that is, you know, tell your attorney maybe that you need a timeout. Yep, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah. Definitely now, especially around the holidays. Slow down. When I see text messages that come in and I see spelling errors, I see missing words, I see sentences that don't make sense, that don't connect, I know that this parent is struggling, that this parent, that there's a lot of emotion and so oftentimes I won't respond right away. I will take my time to respond because I want to give that parent like a little breathing room just to like calm down. You know what they say about when you get an email and you want to write back right away and you're upset and the advice is take 24 hours before you send your reply. So similar with parents going through a divorce or separation, like you said, take that time, slow down. Think about all the potential consequences of your actions, the consequences to yourself, to your children, to your family, and to your friends, because it extends. Everything you do extends just, it, it extends beyond just you. So we need to know that and we need to be aware of that. And when you can control the response time, when you have enough self-control, to just say, okay, that was very upsetting. I need to think about this. I'll write back tomorrow. And in the interim, you may get a follow-up from whomever sent you, <laughs> the, the, your, your soon-to-be former co-parent. Um, you may get, where are you? Did you get my message? Why aren't you returning the call? I need to know now. You don't have to. You are not obligated. If your child's not in danger, if it's not about picking them up, leaving them stranded somewhere, if it's none of that, if it's just the internal dialogue between you and the other parent, you can write back and say, got your message, need time to think, we'll totally be back with you tomorrow. Something like that, right? I love that. And I actually do that all the time in in work, when I don't know how to respond to an email, or I really do need to think about it because I don't want to seem unprofessional by not responding to a colleague or to an adversary, I will write back, um, I received your email. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I need to think about it and get back to you. It's, it's a really good It's practice. a really nice response. Mm -hmm. And people appreciate that. And there's another thing on the Our Family Wizard platform that's really helpful for co-parents. When 
they feel overwhelmed by messages, by emails, text messages, Snapchats. On the platform, there's a lot more control. They can set up a daily digest. So at 5 p.m. once a day, they get all of their messages. And then they could go through that and then they could think about it and then respond on their time. So they feel more empowered and it gives them, like you said, that time to step back, to think, and to respond briefly, informatively, friendly, and firm. And that's the way to go. There you go. There you go. Yeah, you know, um, because I have office hours like you do, nine to six, or actually seven to seven, um, they're long days. But um, I often think, well, I'm sending these emails out during the working day, and my clients are at work, yet they will respond quite often during the day. And I keep thinking, you know, maybe I should even set up something with them uh, when they come in and I first meet them to say, look, I, I have no option but to send you communication during the day. But if it is better for you to wait at night and collect everything, if you're a parent, wait till the kids go to bed, um, for you to just then respond later in the evening, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I wonder, Elle, would the attorneys be fine with that too if that was set up ahead of time and there was no emergency that needed to be addressed? I don't see why not. I mean, everyone has their own style and preferences. Um, I mean, I'm getting hundreds of emails a day. So just to sort through them and put them in the right folders, it, it becomes very, very overwhelming. Now imagine going through a divorce and then getting your hundred plus work emails and then everything else related to your children and finances and everything that's so important to you and your family. So yeah, for a lot of folks, I think that that could be a helpful practice. Yeah, I think I never really used this term before, but I think time management in divorce is as important as time management on your job. Absolutely. Agreed. Maybe even more important. You never know. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm sorry go ahead yeah no and it makes it more like a business relationship when the other parent knows okay my co-parent is going to read these messages at 5 p.m the, uh, then then they have that expectation they know they're not going to get an immediate response and it's important to communicate that I'm going to review all of the correspondence and everything related to our children and family every day at 5 p.m or 9 p.m or whatever that time is that that parent chooses and right. it could help it help reduce and maybe even eliminate a lot of the conflict. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, one thing I'll add to that that I just for years realized, and I said this kind of glibly earlier, it takes two people to argue, it takes one person to be an asshole. Um, when we don't respond to adverse communication immediately, the last thing that's hanging out there is the adverse communication. You're actually giving the author of that adverse communication a t- uh, an opportunity to self-reflect on what they just said. And maybe that's, and that's a good thing, you know, because then they can maybe come back and say, okay, I really didn't mean it, or I shouldn't have said it that way. <laughs> You're right. And oftentimes that does happen. Yes, it does. So you're doing the other parent a favor by not responding immediately, just letting their words be the last words spoken because you know how we love to reread our emails, right? Am yes. I, I'm not the only one that does that, am I? We all do. Okay, right. <laughs> We all overthink, oh, did I say that right? Was that the right way to phrase it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it gives that parent the opportunity to see that. And then when you're lovely at five o'clock or six o'clock or the next morning, whenever it's right for you to respond, when you come back in a lovely communication, you are really changing the dynamic for both of you. Yep. It only takes one You're modeling. They say that parents are always modeling for their children. Well, guess what? Co-parents, you can model for each other and you can each learn from each other's positive interactions and behaviors. Yeah. 
Okay, so there is a lot of hope. I love that. There is so much hope, so much. And family, once you're a family, you're always a family. I love saying may that. Look, yep, it may look different. It may not you know, be exactly the same as it was. You may be living in a different place. New people come in and out of your life, but you're always a family. And that's the perfect place to end this. It really is certainly in the spirit of Christmas and Hanukkah and any other uh, cultural celebratory time that December is. Elle, I, I know that you can only work where you're licensed, but do you do any mediation still? If anybody wanted to work with you as a mediator, is that even possible if I they hear you on this podcast? I thank you for asking. I don't. Mediation is actually very challenging for me. I give you a ton of credit for serving as a mediator. Um, I... I don't think I am the best mediator out there. I think I'm a great guardian ad litem. I love the work I do. I think working for Our Family Wizard and furthering their mission of helping families that are separated and apart thrive is where I belong. Um, I'm happy to always be a support for anyone going through a divorce or separation as best as I could be through those two roles but I'm going to leave the mediating to you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I actually really do love it. Yes, it's enormously challenging, but it's creative problem solving and I absolutely love it. So thank you for that. Thank you for all of your information, your heart, your soul, um, and and what you have added so positively and significantly, Al, to the discussion of, let's turn this around to be amicable, uh, regardless of where we're at, let, let's just do this. Even if it's one person in the relationship doing it, it's better than nobody in the relationship doing it. A hundred percent. Let's so, be amicable. Let's be allies. Let's work together as a team and put our children first and our family first and do what's right. And especially now before the holidays, make this special be present, be, be the, like, I went to this yoga class. I know you want to wrap up, but I just went this past Sunday and the yoga instructor started off by saying, everybody, I want you to close your eyes and Christmas is around the corner. So I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. So I know this isn't about yoga, but her advice was so heartwarming. She said, everybody, instead of focusing on the presence this year, I want you to be present with your families and with your children. And instead of focusing on wrapping those gifts, I want you to wrap your children with love. And instead of focusing on getting your lights perfect and going and seeing all the different lights, be the light in your family. And I left that yoga class. I felt so inspired and it was called Om for the Holidays. And I've been (laughs) sharing it with everybody. I said, be present, wrap your family in love and be the light that your family needs. I love that. I love that, Al. It's a perfect ending. Thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was such a privilege to be here today. Take care of the Berg until I get there. (laughs) I will. And for all of you, regardless of where you live, thank you so much for joining. Um, I, I really appreciate that you put in the time and effort to want to educate yourself about what being doing the best you can do in a very difficult situation called divorce. If any of you would like to present topics to me or communicate with me, you can do that through my website, uh, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. I wish you a very happy holiday. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves. Be kind to your spouse and cherish your children above all else. 